Hey First Pres, What's Up is coming to you from First Presbyterian Church in York, Pennsylvania, providing pertinent and helpful information, inspiration, and encouragement in these challenging times. Hey, and welcome. I'm Guy Dunham for today's program, your host, and it's my pleasure and honor to introduce our guest this morning. He's author and lecturer, Scott Mingus. Hi, Scott. Hey, Guy. Thanks for the invitation. I appreciate being here. It's great. Um, Scott is an author of 24 books on the Civil War, and that includes the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. which is a topic we'll be talking about in a few moments. But before we do, uh, the truth of the matter is there's a whole bunch of people who know who you are, Scott. Well, then there's a whole bunch of people who probably don't, but they will after this, uh, right? Thanks, yep. That's what you want. And so we want to give people an opportunity to get to know who you are. Sure. Just as a person. So you're originally from Ohio. Yeah, I mean, I actually grew up in southern Ohio. I was born and raised in a town... Uh, east of Columbus called Zanesville, Ohio. Uh, mm -hmm. So grew up a diehard Cleveland Browns and Cincinnati Reds fan, both of which, you know, around here nobody cares, but yeah. uh, those are still, you know, areas of keen interest. So uh, went off to college, uh, Miami of Ohio. Uh, I majored in my undergrad in pulp and paper science and engineering. So uh, well, pretty rare degree. <laughs> Tell that to most people. They're like, "What is that?" But it's basically chemical engineering for the okay. paper for the pulp and paper industry. Okay, cool. I know where Zanesville is. Yeah, because we have family in Dayton. Oh, super. And now in Indy. So when we drive out, we go right on I seventy. Of course, yeah. Yep. Just in Dayton last weekend for a wedding. So. Yes, I know. And you had a good time. We did. Thanks. Good. Good. I'm glad to hear that. So, as you said, uh, you're a scientist by profession, and um, what interested you in going in science? Uh, several things. Well, one, in high school, I, in junior high, I was really interested in science and math. Okay. I uh, was fairly good in those in school. Uh, okay. was um, elected to uh, an honor society for called the Joe Berg National Honor Society for Science and Math, uh, and that got me a lot of interest from colleges. Uh, so so there's me a lot of flyers on chemistry and math and engineering programs right. across the country and Miami was really unique in the fact that uh, they had pulp and paper specific majors. My dad was a forestry major at Ohio University, spent his entire life for working for the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. Okay. So I was always interested in forestry and so the idea of, you know, chopping trees down and replanting them and turning them into paper and replanting more. Uh, to me, sounded kind of cool, so that's how I ended up in pulp and paper. Uh, okay, cool. So yeah, so science has always been a, a passion to me, and as you mentioned, you know, I've spent 40 years as a scientist. Uh, first, working for Avery Dennison in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. They're the office products company that some of you may be aware of for notebooks and three ring binders yes. and Avery labels so you get it staples etc yep. uh, I finished there as their global director of uh, pulp and paper technology uh, and then in 2001 Gladfelder recruited me to come here okay. to York County to uh, take over as their global director of new product development so that's what brought you to York correct yeah, it was work related uh, it was kind of a really quick, funny story, but it's appropriate. Uh, sitting on one March snowstorm in typical Northeast Ohio weather, phone rings, and a guy's like, hey, I'm representing a paper mill near Gettysburg. I'm like, there's somebody who did their homework who, like, said the key <laughs> word to me to get me interested in at least coming to talk to him. Wow, wow. So you've also had an interest in Civil War for a long time. I have. Uh, I had a lot of ancestors, guy, that fought in the Civil War. Oh, in fact, okay. one of my ancestors was a 15-year-old drummer boy for the 51st Ohio Volunteers, wow. threw away his drum and picked up a rifle at the mm. Battle of Franklin, uh, and then fought at Franklin in Asheville in 1864. Okay. When he died in 1937, my mom was 13 years old, so she knew him really well. 
And so yeah. I had a lot of first, if well, secondhand stories from mom about what he told her oh. about the war and things. And that just inflamed my passions of, yeah. on my mom's side. And then on my dad's side, uh, had several great, great grandfathers or great, great uncles that fought in the 7th West Virginia, fought in the 183rd Ohio, uh, and also in the uh, 5th U.S. Infantry. And the final one was in the uh, Battery uh, Battery I, 1st Ohio Heavy Artillery okay. uh, as an officer. So lots of Civil War history in our family from the time I was born. So, Awesome, awesome. You're married? I am, and yeah. Debbie and I live in Manchester Township, okay. uh, north of York. Uh, all three of our kids moved here from Ohio to York County. So we're all York Countyans uh, now. And my daughter actually married an eighth generation York County, and so, oh our my great, gosh. so our grandkids have roots that go back in York County to the 1700s. Does that still make her an official York County? Though? Yeah, it does now. Oh, they allow her to? Well, they actually allow me to because, ironically, my sixth great grandfather is buried at Prospect Hill Cemetery. Oh, there you go. Uh, so he actually lived in York for a brief period before moving to Ohio. Okay. So it's kind of like coming full circle, coming back here. Good. Okay. Just 150 years later. Right. And just as an aside, you're a member of uh, Still Meadow? Church yeah, I attend Still Meadow Church of the Nazarene. Debbie and I have been Nazarenes uh, all of our married lives. Okay. Uh, when we moved here from Ohio, uh, you know, we started attending Still Meadow. We actually live near them in, yeah. in Manchester Township. We, um, of course, as First Presbyterian, being a part of Northeast Neighborhood Association, mm -hmm. your, your campus is right. very involved. Exactly. And I'm on the board of Nina. Yeah. So it's been great to so have. So you probably know Pastor Kent Vandervoort. Oh, my gosh, yeah. very much so. Close friend, good good guy. It's, yeah, he is. And I knew Bud Reedy before that. Uh, of course. I go back to the mid-'80s, so sure. I knew Bud then. Yeah. Back and back and I'm still with friends with him on Facebook, so I see what he's doing down there in Charlottesville. There we go. But, um, yeah, good church and awesome what your congregation does there, uh, particularly at the York campus. Yep, appreciate that. Um, so you've written 24 books related to mm -hmm. the Civil War and the Underground Railroad. And we already talked a little bit about when you first got it and why you have an interest right. in uh, Civil War. But um, when did you first start writing books? Oh, let me step back on that uh, because okay. it goes back to my interest. Where I grew up in southeastern Ohio uh, was about 10 miles from the birthplace, uh, well, birthplace, childhood home of Union General Phil Sheridan. Okay. Uh, it's a huge equestrian statue. So I was always interested in the Civil War. So I okay. started writing in college, uh, started doing a lot of research on Phil Sheridan, uh, and then uh, wrote some papers on the Iron Brigade, uh, Wisconsin and Indiana and Michigan unit, the fight at Gettysburg. Uh, and so I've been on and off writing for a long time. I actually wrote for baseball card magazines back in the years when I was a baseball card collector uh, in the early 1980s, 1990s. So I've kind of semi-professionally wrote on and off for a long time. I've obviously written a lot of stuff for work over the years. Yeah. So I have a you know a lot of publications that have appeared in scientific journals, things like that. Uh, when we moved, well, got a few years before we moved to York, uh, I was in deeply into miniature war gaming, and I started writing books on miniature war gaming. Okay. Uh, so I have six additional books. Uh, on war gaming, uh, we moved here in, in 2001. My oldest son moved here, did his master's thesis in Millersville University on the burning of the Wrightsville Bridge, and I'm like, mm. "Well, that's an interesting story, son. There's a book here." And he had no interest at the time in writing a book, and I'm like, "I'll do it." Okay. So that was my first book. Uh, was starting to write about the burning of the Wrightsville Bridge, and then I realized that's a much bigger story because yeah. it includes the surrender of York, the fighting at Hanover Junction, mm -hmm. the first battle of Gettysburg a week before the big battle, right? Uh, and you know, on and on. And so that book was published in uh, 2007, okay. uh, the first edition, and since then I've started writing one or two books a year as a hobby. Okay. I don't think a lot of people really understand how central York County was to the Civil War and, and the kind of dynamics that were going on. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Yeah, I would I agree. I mean, for most people, York's just kind of a place we all live. Yeah. Uh, but back in the, you know, way back, even, you know, obviously 
predating even First Presbyterian. Um, you know, York was founded in 1741. By 1777, 1778, this was the capital, right. briefly, of the, of the, the new United States. It was always a very important town uh, because it was on the main turnpike between Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, as well as the North-South Road that mm -hmm. led from upstate New York down to Baltimore. So being at the crossroads and having you know, later railroads, et cetera, uh, this place was always very, very important. And even now and then during the Civil War, this was the largest town between Baltimore, a slave state, and Harrisburg uh, in a free state. So this was always very much on the minds of the Confederate Army. And in fact, in 1863, in February of 1863, to be precise, Confederate General Stonewall Jackson uh, commissioned one of his map makers, a guy named Ma uh, Major Jedediah Hotchkiss, to draw a map of what turned out to be the Susquehanna Valley mm -hmm. and all the routes of invasion. And York is pretty prominent on that map. Yeah, and, and you know, it, it's too bad, Scott. I, I'm a Jersey boy, mm -hmm. so I didn't know really anything about York when I moved here with my wife and family in 85. It took me a while because... Many times people say, well, wh where are you living now? And they'd say, I'd say, York, Pennsylvania. Oh, where is that? Then I'd have to say, well, it's between Lancaster and Gettysburg, Harrisburg and Baltimore. Exactly. Oh, oh okay. I, I kind of yeah. know what you mean. Right. It was always on the way to somewhere else. Exactly. That's and that's person. unfortunate because that's not really, as you're saying here, who – York is. Right. I mean, it's incredibly connected to our national events. Yeah, I mean, if you go back in history, it was the, you know, and my good friend Jim McClure likes to say that, uh, that all roads lead to York. Yeah. Uh, and I think at one time people realized that to be truth. Today, all roads lead through York. Yes. But back then, it was all roads lead to York, right. uh, which was a much different situation. And frankly, you know, to, to talk a little bit about the Underground Railroad, that's one of the reasons why the Underground Railroad in York County became somewhat synonymous from the very early days is, again, because the roads led to York. Right. And, yeah, we, we want to get to the Underground Railroad because I think, once again, there's a growing interest. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing more on the uh, Underground Railroad, but particularly, and I suppose that the movie Harriet it did. helped a lot sure. with that. But then people don't really understand what an incredible role that York County played in that issue, particularly because we're a border county. Yeah, I think it's true. I mean, if you go back, I think the movie Harriet has <clears throat> caused a resurgence of interest nationally in the whole conversation on the Underground Railroad, that coupled with a number of other social issues, et cetera, in the United States right now. But it's very to me. It's similar to what happened a generation ago with the movie Gettysburg, right. that sparked a resurgence in Civil War interest, <clears throat> uh, which somewhat I think starting to wane in to to some degree. Um, but the movie Harriet, you know, obviously fairly accurately depicts one of the leading characters that most people are aware of. What folks aren't aware of is we have a lot of characters here in York County. Yes. Uh, and Harriet herself is believed to have come to York County on at least one and possibly two of her visits uh, to the north. Right. Um, and she ended up in northern York County at a uh, farm off of Steinhauer Road uh, in Newberry Township, um, owned at the time by a black farmer by the name of Ezekiel Baptiste. Uh, and Baptiste and his wife Elizabeth, or Eliza as she preferred to be called, uh, in the 1840s and 1850s were among a fairly large group of African-American mm -hmm. um, conductors on the Underground Railroad. Baptiste had a lot of experience. Uh, he was born and, and raised in southern York County, but lived most of his youth and uh, early uh, adulthood in Maryland. Uh, saw a lot of the injustice that was going on uh, in Maryland with mm -hmm. the slaves, uh, the folks who were enslaved on the plantations there, and started helping them out. Uh, lived in Philadelphia for a period of time where we believe he first got to know Harriet Tubman. Uh, and then in the 18, uh, late 1840s, he left Philadelphia and moved to Newberry Township, a uh, very rural, incredibly out-of-the-way place even yeah. today. 
hard to get to the uh, pr uh, property they yeah, owned. Really. Uh, but he is uh, regarded as one of the unsung heroes of the Underground Railroad movement here in York County, although he's somebody that, again, most people have never heard of him. But you've heard of Harriet Tubman. Yeah, yeah, yes. Let, let, let's back up a little bit. Sure. Because uh, while many people are familiar with the term Underground Railroad. Good point. And some may know a lot about it. Others who are watching us may know very little about it. Right. So in layman's term, what was the Underground Railroad? Yeah, uh, the Underground Railroad was a very loose network, and I use the term network <laughs> very loosely, uh, of independent and sometimes associated people or organizations that banded together to, to help freedom seekers leave the South, uh, move into the North, and then either find employment in the North or continue to move on to Canada. Uh, those were the, uh, the goals of the Underground Railroad Movement, mm -hmm. again, was to help people uh, escape. Now, the term Underground Railroad has a lot of different interpretations yes, on where it, it started. Mm -hmm. But one of the interpretations suggests that it started in Lancaster and York counties back early in the 19th century. Um, in fact, uh, an author in the 19th century here in York uh, named George Pearl claims that the term Underground Railroad actually started here in the Susquehanna River Valley. Uh, and that the idea was that these freedom seekers are obviously crossing the river somehow. We don't see them crossing the river above ground. There must be an underground railroad passageway under the Susquehanna River. Now, growing up in southern Ohio, there are stories in Ohio that the term originated there in regards to freedom seekers leaving Virginia or Kentucky mm -hmm. and going under the Ohio River into southern Ohio. But I tend to think the Underground Railroad actually began uh, a few years earlier in south central Pennsylvania before it started in Ohio. So I tend to believe now that I've lived here for the better part of two decades that uh, the Susquehanna uh, Valley uh, on over to Philadelphia is indeed where this underground railroad movement began in the United States. Coming from Ohio, you probably have some robust conversations with your friends back in the state. I do, because, <laughs> yeah, Rip, Ripley, Ohio, still thinks it's the birthplace of the Underground Railroad and the National Underground Railroad okay. Museums in Cincinnati. Uh, so, okay. again, you know, wow. that area along the Ohio River certainly is very, very historic for its involvement in the Underground Railroad. Okay. But the claim to being the first, <laughs> somewhat dubious and without a lot of proof anywhere. Yeah, yeah, it's... Um, so l let's get to specifics then about York County so mm -hmm. that people see that there really is a reason why that York County could claim some real fame in right. regard to participating in it. Sure. As you said, it was a, it was a, a loose network mm -hmm. because they didn't have Internet. They didn't right. have even phones, nothing. No, they had nothing. And, I, and one, one way to look at that is – you know, and we think of the term railroad, and maybe that's the most misleading term of all when we talk right. about the Underground Railroad, because we think schedules and destinations and timetables and actual routes, right. you know, where the Underground Railroad was far looser than that. Yeah. Uh, it got started with farmers, uh, you know, mostly Quakers in the early days, uh, simply out of humanitarian reasons, trying to yeah. help freedom seekers. Uh, but when folks started finding out the Freedom Seeker was on your farm, you moved them to a relative's yeah. farm farther away from Maryland, maybe across the river. Right. Uh, and that's where the early beginnings uh, happened. And we believe, in fact, that some of the earliest conductors in York County were the Mifflin family, which lived in Wrightsville. Uh, they were interrelated by marriage with the Wright family right. across the river in Columbia and, of course, Wrightsville being named for them indeed. And so the Mifflins that lived uh, in a house that still exists, in fact, uh, on the northwest side of Wrightsville in Hellam Township, just outside the borough limits, uh, they were helping freedom seekers in, as early as 1810, perhaps even earlier than that, mm. uh, helping them formally get across out of York County into Lancaster County, where, they, again, the Quakers would move them farther east to places like Kennett Square 
or to uh, Redding and Morgantown, uh, and Bird in Hand, uh, those areas, and then eventually to Philadelphia, which became kind of the central clearinghouse in the early parts of the Underground Railroad movement in this area. For people who wouldn't be aware of it, um, there's a real push right now to save the Mifflin House. There are. It's owned yeah. by Mr. Kensley, actually the whole property. Um, there's a business park there. and But there's now a move to try to save it because there aren't really a lot of buildings we can point to any longer, are there, that we know actually house Freedom Seekers. Yeah, I mean, this obviously is one of the properties that, that we can pretty well prove indeed had had Freedom Seekers. Uh, luckily, it appears like the property could be saved. There's been a recent movement by the, the Susquehanna Heritage yes. Association um, with Mr. Platts and a few other people involved mm-hmm. in that uh, that appears like it could have some success in actually not only acquiring the property but interpreting it and making it part of an Underground Railroad Freedom Network trail, if you will. So we're hopeful of saving that. Uh, but to your point, here in York County, the, the majority of the homes that we believe or, or we can show were involved in the Underground Railroad are gone. Yeah. Uh, many of the farms have been, uh, over the years, abandoned. The houses have been replaced. Uh, housing developments, in many mm-hmm. cases, are on top of where there used to be Underground Railroad homes. Now, the nice thing about uh, the two books I've written on the Underground Railroad is we think we can document a pretty fair number of the remaining houses mm-hmm. That are still here and one of the things as you know from reading the book is we have about 20 to 25 different individuals we highlight in the book some of which like the Ezekiel Baptiste house still exists Uh, it's been heavily modified doesn't look anything like it would have in the 19th century Uh, his outbuildings the barns things like that are long gone but we have two properties here in York County that the National Park Service officially designates as underground railroad way stations one of which is just right down the road behind us here on philadelphia street Uh, 123 philadelphia street is the home of william c goodrich Uh, goodrich was another of the african-american black conductors here in york Mm -hmm. county probably the number one conductor in terms of name recognition and possibly even in terms of the number of people that he physically assisted uh, his home has been nicely restored uh, through the efforts of Terry Downs and a number of other individuals that worked on that project. Uh, and so over at 123, again, East Philadelphia Street, that's now currently the William C. Goodrich Freedom Center, mm-hmm. uh, which is open, I think, second Saturday, first Friday type thing, right. or by appointment. Uh, so you can actually tour and you can see the cellar where uh, under mm-hmm. dug on, underneath the kitchen where Mr. Goodrich and his family hid slaves. But other uh, homes here in York associated with them, for example, right around the corner was his in-law, Hamilton Gray's house. That's now a shopping center parking lot. Uh, So, you know, a lot of these homes are long gone here in downtown York. The other one is just outside of York uh, in the township uh, in, I think it's Manchester Township, is the uh, Samuel Willis house. Yes. Uh, and that's off of Willis Road uh, near Willis Run. Uh, and so, you know, loosely it's you know, between Prospect Hill Cemetery and Burger King. Uh, so that's some of that ground off in that's there. That's a wedding venue now. It is. It's a wedding Don't venue. Don't you know about that, Mr. KG? What, the Willis House? Willis House. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, so he's been married in October. I just so he'll be married in an historic Underground Railroad property, so keep that in mind. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that's the original house. It was built in the late 1700s by Samuel Willis's father, who also coincidentally was the guy who developed the courthouse on this, in the square down here in York. Oh, really? So we have the replica courthouse, yes. of course, uh, but that's not where the original courthouse was. It was at the intersection of George and Market, uh, and Samuel Willis, the Underground Railroad's conductor's father, uh, was the chief architect in uh, built? Uh, wasn't actually the architect, but he was the builder uh, and stonemason that put together the uh, brick uh, courthouse that was here. Okay, awesome. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned in your books, and uh, we'll make sure that we uh, have it on the screen later on, as to where people can get the books and what they are, is the fact that particularly 
probably here in York County. Uh, it was dangerous work, was it not? to be a facilitator or a conductor, whatever that word you want to use, in the Underground Railroad? Yeah, let's keep in mind, this. while we talk about the Underground Railroad and we think it's a really cool and really neat thing that people did, mm -hmm. we have to remember it was illegal. Yeah. Uh, in 1793, the United States government, at the behest of Virginia, North Carolina, Maryland, other slave states, uh, convinced Congress to pass a law making assisting freedom seekers, or as the term was used then, for, uh, fugitive slaves, it was illegal to help them. Uh, and so you could be caught, convicted, fined, and thrown in jail mm -hmm. uh, as of 1793 for helping these folks. Then in 1850, the United States Congress passed an even stronger law that uh, called the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850, which then made it uh, six months in federal prison and a fine that, you know, in today's world would be equivalent to several, I think it's three or $4,000 fine in today's uh, dollars. Uh, so this was, this was pretty dangerous work. Now, we don't know of any York Countyans who were actually imprisoned mm -hmm. for helping and uh, being involved in the Underground Railroad, but there were several Marylanders who were shuffling people into Pennsylvania who indeed ended up in the penitentiary in Baltimore uh, for helping people. Uh, there were several York Countyans that were indeed accused. Uh, in at least one case, a court case in, in Virginia, a York Countyan uh, uh, by the name a Quaker uh, by the name of Jonathan Jessup uh, appears in court documents, mm -hmm. uh, but n he was never brought to trial. Although Yardley Taylor, the Quaker in Leesburg, Virginia, who was funneling freedom seekers north into uh, York Township. Uh, to where Apple Hill Medical Center is today, right. uh, a place many of you probably are, have been to over the years. Um, Apple Hill Medical Center was Jonathan Jessup's house, and Jessup was indeed involved with the Underground Railroad uh, right there on that very property. Again, property pretty much gone, now the medical center. Uh, but Jessup never got in trouble with the law. Uh, okay. So we're fortunate in York County that there again, Nobody in the, that we know of at least ended up in prison because of their activities. But there were certainly people who ended up moving out of York County out of fear that they would be discovered, particularly some of the... There was a large network of uh, African Americans in the southeastern part of the county okay. uh, headed by Henry Grant and a number of other conductors. And many of those folks moved out of York County away from the Maryland border after the 1850 uh, passage. Were they concerned for being arrested and convicted, or were they concerned about possible violence against Both. them? Both. Both. Yeah, I, or even worse than with the violence case, there were documented cases here in York County, as there were in many other parts of southern Pennsylvania, of people coming across the border and physically kidnapping yes. York Countyans and bringing them back to Maryland or Virginia and selling them into slavery. Uh, in fact, during, as late as the Civil War during the Gettysburg Campaign, uh, the Confederates that came into Franklin County uh, kidnapped more than 100 uh, mostly freeborn Pennsylvanians uh, and took them back into Virginia to slavery. And we only know of one York Countyan that was captured here in York Borough. Uh, that was, believe it or not, was a 10 to 12 year old boy mm. who was taken off the street by the Confederates and was taken to Richmond and incarcerated in Castle Thunder. So, you know, throughout the Underground Railroad movement, yeah, it was always a danger of violence or, you know, being physically dragged back into slavery. And, and part of it, too, is, is officials here in York County, correct me if I'm wrong, many of them weren't highly cooperative with the law of 1793, or 1850, they tended to, to drag their feet, to slow walk it, to do whatever yeah. they could, which in the long run created growing antagonism and frustration between the North and the South. Yeah, I mean, I'll talk about a couple of the key events that happened. One was the fact that in uh, 1830, mid-1830s, 1836, I believe, <clears throat> um, a freeborn 
man by the name of Jerry Morgan lived in uh, Lower Chancellor Township near Airville. Mm -hmm. He was married to an enslaved woman from Maryland by the name of Margaret Morgan. Uh, freedom seekers uh, had frequently been coming to the southeastern part of York County. And so there was a pretty active black community in that area. Well, Mr. Morgan was part of that community. Whether he was involved in the Underground Railroad or not, we don't think so. But over time, the owners of Mrs. Morgan uh, got wind of the fact she was living in Pennsylvania, had several children, and so they sent bounty hunters uh, here to take mm -hmm. her back to Maryland because by Maryland law, she was a slave. Right. By Pennsylvania's law of 1826 and the uh, Gradual Emancipation Act of 1780, Mrs. Morgan and her children were free Pennsylvanians. Right. So a sheriff from Maryland came into uh, <laughs> southern southeastern New York County, physically took Mrs. Morgan and the children back. They were eventually sold into slavery. Mm. But it created the first known York County legal case in the Supreme Court right. where uh, the attorneys, Thomas Hambly, who... Uh, was an attorney here in downtown York, uh, and Ovid Johnson, who was the attorney general of Pennsylvania, combined to take the case to the Supreme Court with the agreement of Maryland that whatever the Supreme Court said would happen. Uh, because Pennsylvania charged the uh, slave catchers with kidnapping which at that time was a deep offense, particularly kidnapping children. Yes. Uh, but the Supreme Court case ended up ruling that Maryland was right, uh, Pennsylvania's law was wrong. Mm -hmm. That created a backlash in the North mm -hmm. uh, to the point where in 1851, uh, after the passage of the 1850 law, there was a riot over in Christiana in Lancaster mm -hmm. County that led to the uh, arrest and acquittance of 39 uh, uh, people, four Quakers, 35 uh, African Americans. And that led throughout the South to people no longer believing the U.S. government would prosecute right. cases. And that's one of the many spark plugs that led to John Brown going out west to Kansas mm -hmm. and you know, creating bloody Kansas for those who are involved, in, you know, aware that, you know, there was a lot of fighting going on in Kansas and Missouri in the mid-1850s, predating the Civil War. Well, a lot of that was sparked by York County and Lancaster County specifically. Yeah, it's, I'm thinking back on the movie Harriet, mm -hmm. and they they show you the role of slave catchers. Right. I, right. I mean, really, you brutal come to people. despise them. Yeah, brutal <laughs> people. despise them. Yeah, and there were slave catchers here in York County, in fact. There were uh, several slave catchers that lived in uh, uh, Conewago in Newberry Townships. Mm -hmm. uh, they were involved in a celebrated case in the 1820s where they actually killed a freedom seeker at a farm that still exists yes. in Newberry Township mm -hmm. uh, owned by a fellow by the name of uh, Garretson at the time. Uh, so while this is going on, you mentioned, Guy, the fact that you know, some of the people here tended to not really pay attention to the law. There were th three individuals I want to mention just briefly. One was a sheriff. Uh, it was actually a constable of North York uh, Ward and then of South York Ward. His name was William Yoakum. He was from the Yoakum Town area okay. up in Newberry Township. But he had moved to York, and he was a constable. Well, he got a reputation of not obeying the laws that he had been uphold to, to keep uh, because when freedom seekers came into York County, and found, found the constable, as they were supposed to by law, to help them find the escaped slaves, uh, Mr. Yoakum would lead them to the wrong locations. <laughs> uh, and meanwhile, sending messages to William Goodrich and other people involved in the Underground Railroad to get the enslaved people, freedom seekers, out of York County as fast as possible. Uh, now, one of the people that uh, we think Yoakum was probably involved with was Charles Barnett's. Okay. Uh, Charles Barnett's was, uh, in fact, buried here at First Presbyterian Church. Uh, Barnett's uh, was married to a lady I think was a member here. It was well. It was the um, David Grier family. Right. He That's was right. A 
Revolutionary War. Correct. Era. Thank you. Uh, but Barnes was actually a United States congressman uh, in the middle of all this, yes. sworn to make the laws and no yes. one to uphold them. And out of his Springdale estate, which is down near where the Universalist uh, Unitarian Universalist churches on South George Street had a sprawling estate that stretched all the way to where your co your college is now. Mm -hmm. uh, but Mr. Barnett's had a number of African American paid servants that lived on his property, worked for him, and worked with him to move freedom seekers out of York County to the river, where the Mifflins and other people would then take them across the river. Uh, into Lancaster County. So we've got a United States congressman, we've got you know a constable, uh, we've got other activities here in York County from officials that probably should have known better, uh, at least legally. Uh, one of which was down in Hanover, probably the wealthiest, most influential businessman in downtown Hanover in the decades before the Civil War was a guy by the name of Josiah Gitt. Uh, well, uh, Gitt uh, was have or Jake Gitt, maybe his name was, uh, Jacob Wirt, I keep saying Gitt, Jacob Wirt, uh, his house was on the square in downtown Hanover, uh, and Jacob Wirt was the number one conductor in southwestern New York County, okay. uh, even though he's a proper law-abiding citizen yeah. to everybody in public, he was actually the ringleader of everything that was going on in southwestern New York County. And I, I, I think that's what's so fascinating about it. Of course, we also want to mention another member and sure. a, an eventual elder here at first who was also involved in it, David Edder Small of the Small family, mm -hmm. uh, which was a family that was, I don't know if you could say deeply divided, but I think you could say over the issue of slavery and the Civil War yeah. because David Edder Small's um, another relative of another line was David Small with the Gazette, and they were right. Copperheads, yeah. um, peace Democrats who exactly. really didn't want the war, yeah. uh, had mixed feelings about freeing slaves because what are they going to do to our economy and they'll take our jobs, right. or um, they won't work and then they'll be a burden to the taxpayer, exactly. which sounds vaguely familiar. And uh, and here you got David Edder Small of Bill Meyer and Small. Mm -hmm. um, whatever he was doing, we're not really completely sure. But to say that there were a number of people who were high-ranking um, people in the community, mm -hmm. well respected, mm -hmm. as you said, Barnett's. He was an attorney, yeah, a congressman. And they were basically defying the law. Yeah, I mean, a rather great example of that is Dr. Webster Lewis. Yes. Knows the term doctor. I mean, this was the guy was one of the leading physicians in all of northern New York County. And, in fact, his son, Dr. Robert Nebinger Lewis, was the leading uh, physician in Dover. Uh, so we have the son and the grandson of one of the, the leading founders of Lewis Berry, uh, named for the Lewis family, of course. Yeah. Uh, and so what did uh, do the two Dr. Lewis's, father and son, have in common? They were two major league underground railroad conductors. So here we have, again, people who, in this case, take the Hippocratic Oath quite literally that they are to heal people. Yes. They're also to assist people. Uh, and so these mm -hmm. two physicians took it under themselves to become intimately involved with the Underground Railroad in their areas. Uh, so again, you know, we're talking about, you know, congressmen and doctors and lawyers, uh, you know, people who, you know, are the pillars of society. We're also talking about farmers and, and poor uh, oarsmen that worked at the ferry services yeah. and didn't have a nickel to their name. We're talking about African Americans. We're talking about Quakers. We're talking about Presbyterians, we're talking about members of the Moravian community, a number of other denominations as well. Uh, so the Underground Railroad movement, to me, here in York County, is a microcosm of all of America during that period of time, where we tend to have this sometimes naive thinking that the Underground Railroad was just a bunch of Quakers yeah. running around. Well, no, they were heavily involved, Very but it much. was a much, much broader mix of people who were involved. Uh, and uh, Jim McClure and I have talked about several times. It was a group that, you know, social, social classes were different, 
Economic classes were different. Mm -hmm. Educational backgrounds were different. Religious beliefs were different. Uh, the one thing that united these, these conductors or agents was their love for humanity, yeah. that they wanted to see these freedom seekers safely across the Susquehanna River. Because to your point earlier, a guy, you don't want to stay in York County, particularly by the no. 1840s and 1850s. This was a real dangerous place. Uh, and so you wanted to move people out of York as fast as you humanly could. Yeah. And that was the common bond that kept all of these conductors who probably, many of whom never knew each other, uh, certainly would not have been friends outside of mm -hmm. this movement, and yet that was the bond that kept them together. But you, w one thing we ought, need to point out is that one of the things that's difficult in tracing the Underground Railroad and who was involved is that um, documentation is limited because mm -hmm. it wasn't safe to have anything mm -hmm. written down Correct. or evident. Correct. So it, it's a real challenge, isn't it, to find out who these people were, and some of it is obvious and mm -hmm. it's out there. Um, in the case of David Edder Small, it's implied by the fact that the uh, black veterans of the uh, Civil War mm -hmm. named their post right. after David Edder Small right. because of, of how he assisted them to freedom, right. which may be the most that we can possibly uh, know Correct. about what he did. Yeah, exactly right, because for so many of these people, there's not a lot. I mean, unlike Jonathan Jessup, who's named in documents in an arrest record mm -hmm. uh, in Leesburg, Virginia, there's not a lot of legal documentation on a lot of these folks. What we do have is that we have 19th century historians, George Prohl and Israel Betts, right. uh, particularly Dr. Betts, that did a large series of newspaper articles in the early 1910s uh, in the York Gazette uh, and the York Daily, uh, delineating a lot of the conductors that he knew of because he was friends with people like Joseph Wickersham and the Garretsons uh, in Newberry Township who told him of what they did as young men uh, in being their involvement in the Underground Railroad. So we're fortunate York County to have that. We also have the writings and the complete records of William Still in Philadelphia and Howard Sidney Gay in New York City okay. that left documentation that survived uh, journals, log books okay. of Underground Railroad uh, passengers, if you will, including folks who passed through York County. So we're able to mine that. But honestly, you know, in my book, I have a list in the back of maybe 50 to 60 names of people that we've been able to uncover over the years. That's probably a, a fraction of who yes. was really involved. Mm -hmm. uh, and the number one thing I often get from people, and you can appreciate this, uh, I give a lot of talks on the Underground Railroad in York County, including talks I've given here. And people are all the time, well, I've got a tunnel on my property, or I've got this hidden trap door in my kitchen, <laughs> or I've got this barn that has a hidden room in the back of the barn. Yeah. Surely they must have been involved in the Underground Railroad, and how come... You didn't put my great 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 grandpa's story in your book, yeah, because that's all we have is your family story. That and yes, there's a trap door in your kitchen. Fine, we don't know. And they probably were involved because many of these people were on the known routes or the suspected routes, uh, and there had to have been conductors along those routes. Mm -hmm. uh, but we just simply don't have the documentation. So my biggest frustration is the fact that we just simply cannot name many no. of these people. And I'm sure that's the frustration of folks because every now and then I'll get people who say, can you come out to my property and help me prove this was an underground railroad way station? And I'm like, it's impossible to prove. Unless, unless hidden in your attic, you've got a letter from Grandpa. <laughs> Yeah. Or something written on the or wall. Something written, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just so hard to prove otherwise. Yeah. Um, however, that being said, even though we can't prove many of them, right. I think what it does, Scott, is it expands our imagination mm -hmm. and appreciation for what was going on in this county in those decades Absolutely. before the Civil War. Absolutely. I mean, I think the one key takeaway going all the way back to the beginning is York County was an important place. Yes. And so for many of these freedom seekers, particularly those along the border in Baltimore County, Harford County, uh, Frederick County, Char uh, Carroll County, places mm -hmm. like that in Maryland, uh, this was the very first for them 
word they heard was, you know, Pennsylvania was emancipating their slaves in 1780, and people started looking north. And where did the roads go? York County. Uh, And even the roads that led to Gettysburg and places, those roads led east or northeast into York County. Mm -hmm. Uh, So this became a very early and, we believe, very important for at least four decades part of the Underground Railroad movement. Which... I'll say once again, and I know Jim McClure will eventually watch this podcast, but you'll agree, uh, it is extremely important then that as this conversation goes on, that we respect and save the landmarks we have. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Because we don't know what we're giving up if we're if we're ignorant of what is behind that behind that house, behind right. that barn, whatever it may be. Uh, and if it continues to grow, I think it probably will become a part of our tourism here in York, something we have not right. touted in the past. Yeah, I mean, Lancaster County, for example, does a lot more with their Underground Railroad than we do. They yeah. have organized bus tours, uh, a lot of activities. They've got uh, you know, brochures that the, the city of Lancaster mm-hmm. passes out to people with a self-guided walking tour of Underground Railroad sites in Lancaster. Well, these are all visions of what we can do yes. and should do and probably hopefully will do right. in York County as we get more involved in it. Uh, one of the good things is all the publicity in the last uh, you know, two, three to four years about the potential destruction of Samuel Willis's house uh, in Wrightsville has led to a renewed dialogue. Uh, on the importance of preserving properties, mm-hmm. not only underground railroad properties, but but any site with historic significance, at least it needs to be in the conversation uh, as to how do we protect these sites, how do we interpret them, more importantly, if we do protect them, so that people understand what happened there. Well, I know that Jim and I have talked in the past, and he's done a few things in the paper, mm-hmm. about uh, even like with Faith Presbyterian mm-hmm. Church, which... We merged with them back in 1965, one of the first few black congregations in the 1800s. And uh, and then the building was destroyed after they merged with us. Mm -hmm. And we lost a tremendous um, piece of our history as a town, not just simply a church, but a town. And you never can put it back together. It's... Like you said, several of these places, all they are are parking lots. Yeah, exactly. I mean, now, to your church's credit, the one thing you did do that was very important was save the Billmeyer House. Uh, that was after a lot of public outcry. A lot of <laughs> outcry, yeah. There were people who wanted it to go. I know. I, 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 I know. can't believe that, but it, it's true. it was. It was, yeah. Because it was, it was a very, hot topic here. It was very expensive, obviously, and that was part of the reason. It's, it's still expensive to maintain. It is. But, you know, again, if you look at it, it's, I mean— That was a landmark when the Confederates came through York. There were plenty of people who talked about the beauty Mm -hmm. of York's buildings. That certainly was was one of the more beautiful buildings. Uh, Bill Meyer and Small, while we don't have any direct connection other than the anecdotal evidence we talked about David Edder Small, we think obviously Charles Bill Meyer probably knew what was going on, nothing else. Uh, And, you know, were they involved in somehow or another We'll, just, we'll never know. We don't know, but they made rail cars. They made rail cars. <laughs> now, they made rail cars after William Goodrich got started right. with his rail cars, which did have false compartments. Yes. So they could hide enslaved uh, folks who were freedom seeking and move them across the river. Now, his cars were not designed or built by Bill Meyer and Small because they came later. Right. But that's not to say Bill Meyer and Small weren't, uh, you know, doing the same doing thing. The same thing. Because in uh, Columbia, William Whipper and Stephen Smith, who were two black lumbermen, uh, very wealthy lumbermen in uh, Philadelphia, they were certainly hiding things in railroad cars that may have been built by Bill Meyer and Small in the 1850s. Uh, So, yeah, you know, to your point, Guy, we'll never know. All we can do is speculate and, more importantly, keep digging. So the one thing I would encourage those of you who are watching this this broadcast right now is if you have documentation if you have diaries if you have letters if you have anything from your ancestors that talk about uh, being involved in the underground railroad or perhaps your ancestors were freedom seekers uh, 
who came into York County from Maryland or Virginia or points south or southwest, we'd love to have those. So if you, you know, if you have a pencil and paper handy, uh, my email address is Scott Mingus. That's S C O T T M I N G U S. Scott Mingus at yahoo.com. And I'd love to hear your stories because the story of the Underground Railroad, you know, I thought it was kind of done when I wrote my first book on the subject. And then people sent me new information, including finding mm-hmm. the stuff on David R. Small. Uh, and we were able to document new people. And so my hearty goal is that this book will be obsolete in a couple of years and I'll have to write another one with all go. the new conductors that we locate. There you go. Um, we're getting toward the end, but I'd like to make this somewhat uh, relevant to, mm-hmm. to today. Sure. And how would you see what was going on then as it speaks to us today in the 21st century? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. One is... The fact that most of these people were motivated not by personal gain, but they were motivated by a genuine concern for the welfare of others. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's something, you know, I grew up in the hill country of southeastern Ohio. And from the time I was a little kid, you know, our community was raised that we respected each other, we helped each other, we respected the law, other than maybe underground railroad folks (laughs) didn't necessarily respect the law. But the bottom line is, you know, it was a culture that tended to nurture and look out for each other. Mm -hmm. I think we've lost some of that. And I think the story of the Underground Railroad, uh, to me, is the fact that we can, we can even today, help people in need. Uh, You know, they may not be escaping slavery in Maryland, but there are people who are escaping (coughs) addiction, they're escaping drug use. They're escaping abuse. They're escaping different things. Mm -hmm. And if there are ways we can help them legally now today. uh, But, you know, I I think the message of the Underground Railroad still resonates for that very reason, that people setting aside the risk to themselves, whether, you know, it's, uh, you know, for your reputation or some dollars or in the case of the Underground Railroad, personal freedom, uh, people were risking things and willing to go out on a limb for somebody else. Yeah. That's the key message. Yeah, and um, I don't, I don't want to get into a big debate, but the very fact, like you kind of implied, is that you have people here who were tasked with upholding the law, and yet at the same time they chose to break it right. when they felt that that concern for their fellow human beings was more important exactly and and I, that's a tough issue i mean we, well, we can very tough argue issue. that from sunrise to sunset right but the bottom line is these people made that decision mm-hmm. even though they had relatives in what was a relatively small town mm-hmm. uh who vehemently disagreed with them absolutely i imagine they didn't have Thanksgiving dinners very well <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, you, i mean we still even to this day don't we scott where even families are having a difficult time t- t- discussing some of the most polarizing kind of questions. There was nothing more polarizing than you're breaking the law to help slaves who are, quote unquote, the property of people to get away. Yeah, and particularly in an area like this, because keep in mind, so many of these families in New York County were interrelated by marriage to yes. Marylanders. And in yeah. Maryland, slavery was perfectly legal and a very accepted part of their economic and social society. Yes. And so, you know, many of them, you know, Germans, Scots Irish, you know, English, uh, you know, there was a lot of sympathy in York County then for the fact that, you know, these Marylanders were losing their property. Yeah. Uh, and so you really had three choices, you know, in York County. Your, your three choices were to break the law and help freedom seekers. Two, you could uh, help the law and turn them in and maybe get a reward. Or you could do what, frankly, most York Countyans did then and, frankly, what I fear most of us do today, and that's ignore the issue. You know, yeah. if, the door, if somebody knocks on your door back then in the middle of the night, according to several newspaper articles, the number one response in York County was don't turn on the lights, don't open the door, don't get involved, leave me alone. Yeah. And that apathy was what fostered 
the slave catchers because they knew there were only a select few that were actually going to open their door and help. Most, and I think that's, most people didn't. That's an important point there because even though we were talking about all these people who were involved in it, percentage-wise, they were a small percentage small. of the population of York. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about identifiable 50 to 60 people over 60 years. Yeah. I mean, so you're talking about, you know, a very t- – I mean, we're, York County had a population of some, you know, 60, 68,000 or so during the Civil War. And yet I can document 10 people during the yeah. Civil War years. Which I mean, means that those in the community or family members – who knew what they were doing and didn't like it, you can only imagine the kind of tension that that created between friends, between business associates, mm-hmm. in, in family, uh, it's just sure. culturally. There was a tremendous amount of tension that we don't even appreciate that was going on that these people were doing something that others thought they should not be doing. Oh, exactly. But they didn't turn them in. No. To their yeah. credit, they didn't turn them in, but they certainly would suspect that they were what they were doing was illegal. Exactly. Illegal under the law. It, it'll, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and I think the other key part of that is, again, to the point, whether we got lucky or we were blessed or we were fortunate, nobody in York County was turned in or, and went yeah. to jail. Where that's not true in other places. And Cumberland County is a great example. Daniel Kaufman who was bringing uh, freedom seekers in from York County as well as from Franklin and, and Adams County into com- into his, his farm in Cumberland County. He was economically ruined by it. And his brother ended up serving the Confederate Army as an officer. Mm. Uh, so, you know, we're talking about, you know, again, you know, it may be an extreme case, but on one hand, you've got a devout abolitionist, and on the other hand, you've got a Confederate officer uh, in the same household. Right. Uh, you know, when they were at least young, young lads growing up. Wow. So, well, Scott, we could we could go on and on and on. I could. I I I need to at least show the cover. Sure. And then you can tell them where they can find them. Um, this is the first one I read. The ground swallowed them up. It's fascinating. It's filled with so many stories, and I learned so much about uh, the Underground Railroad in York County. From this book. Thank you. And it's also how I found out that some of our members were actually in some way party to it. This is the most recent book, Guiding Light, Underground Railroad Conductors. And awesome. It's short read, but it's easy and really come to appreciate it. Uh, also appreciate how clever some of these people are. They were in hiding freedom seekers. And so fascinating stories oh, yeah. in that regard. So where are the various places people can find these sure. books? Sure, thanks. Yeah, I mean, York County History Center sells both of the books. Uh, York County History Center physically published uh, the first book you showed, uh, Guy, The uh, Ground Swallowed Them Up, Slavery and the Underground Railroad in York County. So that's a more comprehensive view of the entire political issue, okay. slavery, <clears throat> the emancipation movement in, in Pennsylvania and in York County, and then the Underground Railroad. The second book, the smaller one, is actually more of a story book uh, where I have a chapter on each of 25 or so different Underground Railroad conductors, very very short, one to two to five pages for most of them. That book's a little more widely available. It's, again, York County History Center, TG Books out on Industrial Highway, the York Emporium here in town on Market Street, uh, Columbia Crossings uh, River Trail Center okay. over in Columbia on Walnut Street sells it, as does Civil War and More, which also sells most of my Civil War books uh, on uh, in Mechanicsburg. Uh, and a number of other uh, places, uh, including Amazon. Uh, and some of the books are also available on Target.com and Walmart.com as well. Great, great. Well, I strongly recommend them. Thank you. appreciate that. And you didn't pay me to say that. I know. I did. No, it, it really is. It, it's great. Thank you so much, Scott. I appreciate being here today. It's been a real privilege. So um, once again, we thank you. Thank you. And for all those of you who have been watching today, um, We are glad to have you with us. And until we see you again, wishing you grace and peace in our Lord Jesus Christ.